you've all heard this phrase before. We've won the battle, but we haven't yet won the war. But for us as Christians, you know, it's the opposite. We already know we've won the war. Because of Jesus Christ and his victory through the resurrection, we have won the war. Amen? We will all one day be in glorified bodies for all of eternity with our victorious resurrected king. But the question for you today is, are you winning the battles? Are you winning? Because we're not in heaven yet, and we're all gonna have many, many more spiritual battles to fight until we get there. In Ephesians chapter six, Paul teaches us how to stand and to fight the spiritual battle against Satan and his demons. So we're going to go ahead and read the whole passage of scripture that will take us three weeks to cover, beginning in verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. First off, I think it's really important to notice that Paul doesn't invite us into this battle as though we have an option to enlist or not. He states it very matter-of-factly. The truth is spiritual warfare has already been a big part of your past, whether you realize it or not, and it's going to be a big part of your future as long as you're on planet Earth. Listen, guys, it is very important for you to believe in Satan. You need to believe in the reality of Satan just as much as you believe in the reality of Jesus Christ. Because the easiest way for an army to win a war is if the other army doesn't even know there's another army who's attacking them. So today, I hope what comes to the surface of your heart and mind is the very realization that you are in the war, that whether or not you like it or not, You're standing in the midst of a battlefield and the enemy has his crosshairs on you continually. Today's message is titled Basic Training because before any army goes out to war, they first need to understand, they first need to study their enemy. It would be really dumb to engage an enemy without having first studied all there is to know about them. Remember the Apostle Paul is the one who said, let's not be ignorant of Satan's devices. So as we begin our basic training today, we're gonna start by looking at the leader of their army. So if you're ready, let me hear you say, let's do this. Satan, or Lucifer, was his original name. 
not the best choice for your infant. Lucifer was at one time called the anointed cherub, an anointed angel. He was a very high profile angel who had some pretty amazing benefits and a very high ranking. In fact, later on, I really encourage you to read this chapter. You can jot it down, Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28 describes him as being full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Uh, Many scholars suggest because it talks about him having pipes and timbrels built into his body that he could have been, he might have been the worship leader in heaven before his fall, that he was basically a walking, beautiful musical instrument, a walking organ. It's very fascinating. He's not cheesy. He's not corny. He does not look like a 1980s metal rocker. Did you guys know what I'm talking about? <laughs> when I was a little kid, my, my, my sister was into these 80s metal glam hair. I call them butt rock bands. <laughs> and um, like on, it was cassette tapes, right? And on the cover of all these cassette tapes were these dudes and they were all like, <sighs> it was like fake blood coming out of their mouth and draggy teeth. And they're like makeup, their hair was higher than any woman's hair in this room, I guarantee that. And they got like spandex and they, they weigh about a buck oh five, you know, they're just these, <laughs> is, Satan does not look like that. Nor does the Bible ever tell us he's red with a tail with a pitchfork in his hand. Ezekiel 28 says he's beautiful and that he was perfect, a perfect creation of God before he fell. And you know what? His temptations and propositions usually seem pretty perfect and beautiful as well, don't they? I personally believe that Lucifer fell after God created Adam. The Bible talks about all the sons of the morning, all of the angels worshiping God when God created everything. After God created everything, he said, it's all perfect. It's all good. The only thing he says wasn't good was that man should be alone, so he gave him the woman. But everything was great. I don't think Lucifer had fallen yet. I personally think that what happened to him is that being this magnificent being, and the Bible tells us that angels are higher beings than men, as he looked at Adam and says, you want me to serve that? Look at that insignificant creature. The Bible says angels are sent to be ministering spirits. God did not create angels in his image. God has given human beings way more privileges than angels created in the image of God. God called man to have dominion over the earth, not angels. God has called man to rule and reign with him for all of eternity, not angels. And I think Lucifer was doing pretty good and then he saw Adam and he said, what? Hold up. And the jealousy and the pride filled his heart. The prophet Isaiah gives an account of his fall from heaven. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15 tells us, it tells us, (laughs) How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. The sin of Satan is pride. It was selfishness and being consumed with self instead of laying his life down for what God wanted. He, it, these are the I will, the I am statements of saying, I will do what I want to do. And God says, oh, no, you won't. You're going to be down to the lowest parts of hell. That's where you're going to go. You will not rise up above. And he fell. Pride and being consumed with self. 
It's in all of us, isn't it? He's given 27 titles in the Bible. I'll give you just a few. He's called Satan 52 times. He's called the tempter, the deceiver of the whole world, the ruler of demons, the evil one, the father of lies, a murderer, the ruler of this world, the God of this age, the adversary, a roaring lion, the serpent, the dragon. He's also called Beelzebul, which translated means the Lord of dung. He is the Lord of poop. Sounds about right, doesn't it? Sorry, ladies, when a guy says poop, we just can't help but to chuckle. <laughs> He's also called the accuser, listen, the accuser of God's people. He's called the devil 35 times. Devil means slanderer. The accuser and slanderer of God's saints. And so we all need to be careful that we're not walking around being little devils ourselves, going around accusing and slandering God's people. We need to treat each other the way God treats us because you're all thankful God doesn't treat you the way you've treated other people, correct? And God is not there trash talking us. Romans chapter 14 verse 19 says, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. So that's a little bit about who the devil is, a, a mild snapshot of who the devil is. But now let's look at what he wants to do. What is his mission? First Peter chapter five, verse eight says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Devour means to destroy or to swallow up. Jesus said his aim is to steal, kill, and destroy everything good in your life. Have you ever read in the book of Job about the time when Satan came to talk with God? We'll read it. Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 7 says, Now there was a day when the sons of God, these are angels, they came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them, which tells us God and Satan have conversations. The Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. What do you think Satan was doing going back and forth on the earth? He was prowling around like a lion looking for someone to devour. It's like, it's like the kid at the swimming pool who hasn't yet changed into his clothes yet, his swim trunks. He has his normal clothes and he's standing right by the edge of the pool and to all his buddies, he, it's just too tempting. And as these 10 dudes run over to him, he knows he's going down. He knows there's not a chance for him. But he's like, okay, I'm gonna to bring as many of you suckers as I can him with me. He knows his time is short. The closer the time gets, the more fierce his attacks on the church become. And he's just trying to take as many people down as he can with him. The point is that I want you to understand the devil is real. He's very active. He doesn't take days off. And he would love to kick you in the face while you're already down. Now, there's usually three takes or three attitudes Christians have when it comes to the subject of spiritual warfare. The first attitude is an overemphasis and a, a preoccupation with Satan. You know, devil's, the devil's behind every little thing. And, and that's not healthy to give him too much credit. The second take is the extreme opposite. Some Christians just choose to be ignorant of it. It could be because it's, it's just a little too weird and freaky for them. It's a little too uncomfortable. Uh, others are kind of cynical about it. 
Uh, ignorance, you know, some just, they, they just don't want to think about it. But the third take is the biblical position. We do not want to neglect spiritual warfare at all because it's around us every day. But we don't want to be the crazy person that everybody thinks is a weirdo either. Like, you remember Bobby Boucher's mom in The Water Boy? <laughs> well, mama said, you're the devil, you know. Like foosball's the devil, and Vicky Valencourt's the devil too, you know. <laughs> you remember that, right? <laughs> For the rest of our time, we're going to exegete verses 10 through 12. Read verse 10 with me. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The point is that we don't have the strength or the resources by ourselves to win. The Apostle Paul points us to the power we don't have by ourselves. So listen, it's not about you putting your mouthpiece on and getting in the ring and duking it out with the devil. That's not spiritual warfare. Because the battle belongs to the Lord and we want to put Jesus in between us and the devil as much as possible. This is talking about entering into the realm of God's presence and realizing and taking and trusting in the power that he provides that is otherworldly. Because listen, you're not fighting for victory. You're fighting from a place of victory. You're fighting from a place of victory because Christ has already won the war. He defeated Satan at the cross. So be strong in that victory. I remember standing before a, a demon-possessed woman one time, and I could talk all about the cross I wanted to, but as soon as I mentioned the resurrection, she wanted nothing to do with me. She would run. Every time the word resurrection would admit, run, run, go, because that demon was defeated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you have been seated in the heavenly places. You have access to the throne of God, and you pray and you fight from that place of resurrected victory. I can talk about it. That's as far as I can take you. The Holy Spirit is the only one who can really help you to understand that and to fight from that place. And he'll teach you if you ask him. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 says, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Everyone say, Christ's in me. Listen, Christ in you, and then realized by you, that's your key to victory. I mean, Christ is in you, but you go through days and seasons where you realize him more than other seasons, correct? You have some days where we don't even realize him at all. He's in us, but it's the realizing. What helps us to realize him? Well, reading the Bible, hanging out with Christians, popping in some worship. Christ realized by you. That's the whole key to the victory. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 29 through 31 says, he gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's a picture of someone in victory. It's not their own strength because we are weak, but it's his strength realized. Read verses 11 and 12 with me. It says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, 
against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. I want to focus on the word wrestling. Because to wrestle, that is hand-to-hand combat. It'd be nice if the the Lord kept demons at a distance where we could kind of like lob some weapons towards him, but that's not what it tells us here. To wrestle is to be up close and personal. And if we could only see, guys, if God would only rend the curtain for us, if we could only for one minute see the reality of what's happening even in this room right now. Oh, I'd freak out. Wouldn't you? Um, We would, we would trip out. People would think we were crazy for the rest of our lives because that's all we'd want to talk about. Like, holy cow, this is so real. Up close and personal. Paul's trying to say they get close. They get in your ear. <laughs> Back when I was in high school and I was just in full rebellion against God, you know, sleeping around, drugs, every, just everything, everything in rebellion I could do at that time. I was given a book by, the author was Frank Peretti. It was called This Present Darkness. And Frank Peretti is kind of like the Stephen King of Christian authors. And literally, God used that book to scare hell out of me. I mean, it's a fictional book, but it it talks about demons and angels. And it just, it tripped me out. And it put the fear of God in me in a good way. Man, the Lord really used it. Notice it says we're not to wrestle against flesh and blood. How many times does the enemy get us to just look at people or the person and that's not where the battle lies. Now, I, I, I kind of wish it was because, listen, the battle would be a whole lot easier if it was against flesh and blood, you know what I mean? Like, you know. But that's not it. We need to remember that. Jesus once looked at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. That was not Peter's best day. (laughs) But Jesus wasn't fighting against Peter. He knew who was working behind the scenes. Do you realize what's happening in your own life behind the scenes right now? Are you aware? What's really happening in the spiritual realm when you're raging and cussing someone out in your head? What's really going on? Or what are demons doing right at the moment before you're you're about to partake in that sin? What's really going on? We all wrestle with stuff, don't we? Every day we wrestle. Paul wants to teach us how to get better at it. Thankfully, perfection is not the standard. We already have one perfect one who's gone before us. But we may grow. We may get better. We can, you know, through ups and downs, hopefully the trajectory is is upward in our battle against these spiritual hosts. Notice how the enemy is described in verse 12. They're described as principalities, powers, rulers, spiritual hosts of wickedness. The word principality means those with position. And I'm not going to break this all down and nerd out on this, but this is describing an organized army where demons have different rakes, different territories, and different assignments. The prophet Daniel, in the book of Daniel, clues us into what he faced. I mean, he was a pretty big deal. He was used of God greatly. And so there were some big time demons, demons in charge over countries that were messing over him. The Bible reveals there's demons assigned to countries. And then they have people under them. I mean, He's been at this game for a long time. He he knows what he's doing by now. It says they're in the heavenly places. It's in the spiritual realm, so you can't always see it, 
but you can see the results of it because they impose a kingdom of lies and darkness and rebellion. Verse 11 tells us, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, wiles of the devil. Wiles means schemes, methods, or strategies. You know, he's scoping you out. He's not just going to come blind, like, just charge stupidly towards you. He's, he's just kind of always there hovering, just waiting, knowing what pushes your buttons. And he knows how to attack. And so it's important for us to know Satan's strategies. I, I think there are certain things that happen in our lives that when they happen, we can be sure to expect some kind of an attack. And I think we need to think this way. So he, here's a few things that you know when they happen, you can expect some warfare. How about when you start to get fired up about God's word? The devil hates the word of God, the knowledge of God. What about when the Lord really stokes your heart to get involved in some sort of ministry and God begins using you for the kingdom? You instantly become a target. You should expect something. Anytime you make a move towards serving God, you can expect something to happen because the devil knows that the fullness and the joy comes when we are doing something for the kingdom and not just living for our own little kingdom ourselves. If you ever recommit your life to God, he says, oh, really? And he'll make all your non-safe friends say that too. Oh, really? <laughs> what about, you've all experienced this. What about Saturday night or Sunday morning right before church? Come on, can we just be real? Half of you hated each other and fought on your way to church this morning. I'm sure of it. <laughs> I can't even tell you the stuff that's happened at like four or five in the morning right before church. Sickness and dogs puking out both ends all over the carpet. Just cra I think back to crazy things. Just the enemy not wanting the word of God to go out, you know? Right before God's about to do something big in your life, the enemy will anticipate it and, and he'll fight against it. There's probably other things that you can think of. And, you know, I, I, I don't want this idea of spiritual warfare to seem so complex to you because it's really simple when I think of it this way. It's really simple. Satan wants to play God. I mean, all, all the symptoms come from this root problem. Satan just wants to be God. He wants a little bit of taste of the glory, you know? That's what he wants. Yeah, Nacho Libre is a bit outdated in 2018, but still. He wants to see what it tastes like, you know? <laughs> and you know what? The devil's really good at getting people to give him their attention and their time. Listen, the thing most people don't realize is you don't have to bow down on your knees and to become a Satan worshiper in order to give him worship. He is a sick, egotistical maniac that will take attention in any shape or form. He'll do anything to get your attention off of Jesus Christ. That's why he's okay with taking the form of idols. Totally cool with that. Devotion to an idol is devotion to Satan. Again, he'll receive any kind of attention he can get from y'all. So what's an idol? Well, it's anything in our lives that become more important than God. And, and it's easy to say, well, Josh, you know, nothing's more important to me than God. But I've had it happen to me and so have you where we've put Jesus on the back burner, usually accidentally, because other things in life or one thing in life just becomes too important than what it should be. 
And then we prioritize the idol over spending time with God, spending time with God's people, and worshiping him and being fed from his word. And here's where spiritual warfare comes in. Because the Bible suggests that this idol, this thing, or this place, or this experience, or this person has been strategically placed and nurtured into your life by demons. God isn't the only one who wants to plant and water things to grow in your life. Some people are starting to get uncomfortable in here. That's good. Demons love it when you turn to this idol because to them and to God, they're both looking at where your heart is placing its attention and its devotion. And Satan's very willing to negotiate with you. Oh, he will barter. He will barter. And he will scope and scheme something to give you exactly what your flesh wants. He'll do it. I remembered one time when I was like, oh, man, I I really wish I could have some connection to get some free drugs. Satan obliged. A couple weeks later, got this sweet, well, it wasn't at the time it was a sweet hookup. He'll negotiate. He'll do it. As I said before, you don't have to bow your knees to him in order to give him exactly what he wants. And where spiritual warfare gets really gnarly is that Satan will take the form of that idol. So you're not just partaking with the idol, you're partaking with demons themselves. And guys, please listen to this. Listen to this. If he leads you astray with idols, he's gonna withdraw destruction and tensity and anxiety from your life because you're, you're in this pocket right where he wants you to be. You're just in love with the idol and he's like, okay, 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 don't rock the boat. No, 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 don't, don't, don't let anything. If you let something bad happen, he might pray because he only prays when bad stuff happens, you know. Let's just, whatever. And he just will keep you in that pocket. But as soon as you make a move closer to God, what happens in your life? all hell breaks loose. If you know what I'm talking about, say, "Mm mm-hmm. You'll never sit back and just allow God to do something in your life without putting up a fight. When you come back to God, you become a marked man or a marked woman again. And you need to remember that. You just need to be aware of it. Not freaked out by it, but aware of it. Paul encouraged us that we're able to win these battles. And the key is right here in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And guys, I don't know about you, but for me, being strong in the Lord is when my prayer game is strong. Right? I mean, I'm strong in the Lord when I pray. I don't know how to be strong in the Lord when I'm not praying. It's, it, it, you know, we're, we're people. We're not robots. We have to have encounters with him. And the more we encounter him, the more stronger we get. So let me show you how prayer defeats the devil in your life. If you look up at the screen, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. The word destroy is mentioned twice. That's an awesome promise to God that through prayer, we are able to destroy strongholds. Strongholds deal with idols and habitual sins. And have you ever met someone who they, as a self-defense mechanism against God, they have built fortresses up within their heart that oppose God from coming in. And they are tough fortresses and castles to crack. Thankfully, no one is beyond the grace of God. 
But God has not just a foothold, but a stronghold, a fortress of reasons of why this person will not come to Jesus Christ. Prayer can destroy strongholds in you and in the people that you're praying for. We can also destroy arguments. Now, realize this is not talking about you being the person who just argues and debates with everyone and you win the argument, but you lose the soul. That's not, it's more talking about the spiritual realm. This isn't talking about speaking out loud to anybody. This is talking about the arguments that we wrestle with. This deals with your mind and having a healthy thought life. Guys, if people really knew how much you talk to yourself, they would think you're stinking weird. <laughs> I do. I mean, we have conversations within ourselves all that we go back and forth, right? We're a bunch of weirdos. And, oh my goodness. Some people, they, they just don't have the protective barrier and just they're flooded, flooded thoughts, thoughts, anxiety, stress, low self-esteem, they're a piece of crap. Uh, all, just, you know, there's Christians. If this, there's Christians who on a weekly basis struggle with even believing if Jesus loves them. God can deliver you from that, sir or woman. Destroying arguments that the enemy has put within yourself or again, maybe with the person you're praying for. Taking every thought captive. When these loose Wicked arrows from the enemy come. We're able to snatch them and break them and take that captive and put it under the obedience of Jesus Christ because we fight from a place of victory because Christ is in us and realized by us we become beasts for the kingdom of God. We win. He wants you to win. No matter what happens to you, no matter what befalls you, you can walk through it in victory. Job said, though you slay me, whatever, to keep a heart of faith and to go strong until you reach that finish line and you hear the voice say, well done, good and faithful servant. Keep running your race and always moving forward, forgetting the trash that's in your past. Put your past in the past. Amen? Friends, there's only one thing left for us to do. All this talking about it is done. We need to pray. We need to pray, don't we? Well, I mean, God's spoken things to me. I hope he's spoken things to you. Because God can heal. He can deliver. He's an ever-present help. We can cast our cares on him because he cares for us. So as Eddie and the band, as you guys begin to come forward, you know, there's some people in this room and you are in some crazy battles right now. If you had a hard time focusing at any part, please tune in right now. You're in a battle, and the battle is waged against you. And you're wrestling and you're fighting. And in a moment, we're going to call upon God to deliver and to help. Some of you fight against anxiety every single day. You're like the pinball in the pinball machine. You're just like, psh, emotions, crazy. God wants to take that pinball and just, your emotions, your anxieties, and just squeeze you and compress you with his love. And he just wants to speak to you, be still. Know that he's God. He doesn't want you to live with these anxieties every day. He wants you to fight. Some of you 
struggle with guilt and, and mistakes that you made from your past. And you, you, you'll be driving on the freeway thinking about God and all of a sudden you'll just get blasted from something you did a long time ago and it's not from God. There's no condemnation for you. You're forgiven. And he wants to deliver you from these feelings of guilt because, gosh, they'll mess you up, won't they? They'll make you feel like you can't even pray. Sometimes it's so debilitating, you're just like, I can't even go to church. When God's like, I don't see any sin. You've been covered by the blood of the Son of God. Pray for that today. There's some of you who you struggle with lust and looking at pornography almost on a daily basis. Mostly men, there could be some women. Can we get real today? We are flesh, we are weak. You are tempted. And the same temptations you face, all our brothers and sisters around the world face. You're not weird. You're a human. God, God doesn't want you to, every time you see a pretty girl with, like, or, like girls like to let their butt cheeks hang out today. It's like, gosh, what a broken woman to think she has to live that way. She is broken inside. And it's like, God can give you power to bounce your eyes, to not, to not, wants to deliver you just from that awful, gnarly temptation that only leaves you feeling like a piece of junk when you let yourself go there. Some of you fight every day against addiction. You're in the right place. You're loved here. This is a good place for you to be. We won't judge you. Some of you fight against low self-esteem, don't you? you? Every time you look in the mirror, you just, it just makes you want to be alone. You just want to disappear into a cave because the enemy's made you feel like, I hate, I love God, but I hate humans. That is not the work of God in your life. You need people. The Christian life was created by God to be communal, just as the Trinity has communion. It flows down with us. You need Christian brothers and sisters in your life you can trust. Yeah, we'll annoy each other from time to time. That's no biggie because the benefits far outweigh whatever junk happens. Don't isolate yourself. Oh my goodness, an isolated Christian will be a defeated Christian. God loves you. He wants to teach you to have a healthy self-identity that's rooted in Christ not based on how you might think you look or feel or what people have said about you. For others of you, man, the enemy tries, he tries to set triggers off in your life that will immediately bring up the same exact pain you felt from something that happened to you 10, 20, 30 years ago. It's that long ago, and one event has formed and shaped your mindset and your behavior and how you deal with life. Can that be cut off and severed by the power of Christ? It can. God doesn't want you feeling like that. My goodness. Just want a second, whatever you happen to be dealing with, in just a moment, whoever needs prayer, I'm just gonna ask you to stand to your feet. Because we, we believe in a God who heals, correct? When we come to pray, we're not just like, oh, maybe he'll do it. We have precious promises that will not be realized without a heart of faith. It's the only thing God requires of us, just to have a little bit of faith, to believe in him, to believe in his goodness towards us.
if you don't struggle with this daily raging conflict within, then you're not a human being. We're weak, guys. Gals, you'd be surprised that other women deal with the same gnarly stuff you do in your heads. We're all pretty much identically the same when we compare ourselves to God. You know, he's so much bigger, it puts us on a plane of even ground. There's no super privileged Christians. There's no superstar Christians. There's just some Christians who wait on the Lord a little longer, who believe in him a little bit more deeply. And that makes all the difference. So let's ask God to do what only he can. If you need prayer for something, Whatever God spoke, if the Holy Spirit has come upon your heart and highlighted something to you, then let's pray. Would you stand to your feet?